be talking to us about intracranial physiology in traumatic brain injury. So Katie, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Pabu. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, good morning. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, uh, intracranial physiology and traumatic brain injury. So according to CDC data published in uh, 2019, the incidence of TBI has increased from 2006 to 2014. And just in 2014, there were 837,000 health events related to TBI in children, 812,000 ED visits, 23,000 admissions, and 2,500 deaths. Um, Data trends suggest that these numbers have only continued to increase since 2014. The mechanisms of head trauma leading to brain injury include blunt impact, penetrating trauma, blast wave injury, and accelerating decelerating force. In TBI, the primary injury results directly from the initial forces generated by trauma at the impact site or on the opposite contracu side. Primary injury types include skull fracture, localized injuries such as hematoma and contusions, and diffuse axonal injury where severe inertial angular forces produced by acceleration deceleration produce immediate physical shearing or tearing of the axons. Secondary injury like hemorrhages, edema, or blood-brain barrier disruption occurs over the next seconds, minutes, and days, and is promoted by hypoxemia, hypotension, intracranial hypertension, hypercarbia, abnormal glucose, enlarging hematomas, coagulopathy, seizures, and hyperthermia. This graphic from the 2019 Pediatric TBI Consensus Guidelines shows the treatment pathway for first-tier therapy and TBI. These treatment goals aim to maximize oxygenation and ventilation, support circulation, and control cerebral perfusion pressure, and decrease intracranial pressure, and decrease cerebral metabolic rate to decrease demand. Any idea who these gentlemen are? Well, they are the two 18th century Scottish surgeons, the famous doctors Monroe and Kelly. In 1824, Kelly described the post-mortem appearance in the bodies of two individuals found dead after lying outside after a storm. He concluded, when the cavity of the cranium is encroached upon by depression of its walls, com compensation may be made at the expense of circulatory fluid within the head. Less blood is admitted and circulated. Kelly gave credit to his illustrious preceptor in anatomy, the second Monroe. From, the, from Drs. Monroe and Kelly, we have the Monroe-Kelly Doctrine, which states, that the sum of the volumes of the brain, CSF, and intracranial blood is constant. An increase in one should cause a decrease in one or both of the remaining two. As the brain and arterial blood volume have minimal, if any, compressibility to compensate for an enlarging intracranial mass, the venous blood volume can be translocated out of the intracranial vault into the jugular veins and CSF can translocate out of the vault to the spinal subarachnoid space. Once these compensatory mechanisms are overcome, intracranial pressure rises precipitously. We are taught that the golden rule of neurocritical care is CPP equals MAP minus ICP. This equation dictates that as intracranial pressure approaches mean arterial pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure is compromised. Further ischemia then worsens cerebral edema, further elevating intracranial pressure and reducing cerebral perfusion, potentiating herniation. In clinical care, CPP is used as a surrogate for cerebral blood flow. 
Cerebral autoregulation provides constant cerebral blood flow over a wide range of CKPs and is coupled to metabolic demands of the brain. After traumatic brain injury, cerebral autoregulation becomes uncoupled from the metabolic demands of the brain, and cerebral blood flow is no longer pressure reactive. Outside of the autoregulatory plateau, cerebral blood flow becomes pressure passive and intracranial pressure dangerously rises. Hypotension with disrupted cerebral autoregulation rapidly leads to cerebral ischemia, while hypertension above the autoregulatory threshold increases the risk of hyperemia. The 2019 Consensus Guidelines for Pediatric Severe TBI Management reviewed the existing literature to help give treatment recommendations to guide care. A weak level three recommendation is given to target an ICP threshold of 20 millimeters of mercury or less. The guidelines also give a weak level three recommendation to maintain a CPP of 40 millimeters of mercury and above to improve outcomes. To ensure that the minimum value of 40 is not breached, it is recommended to set a CPP target between 40 to 50. The guidelines mention that there may be age-specific thresholds with infants at the lower end and adolescents at the upper end of this range, but the data does not yet exist to support this. A recently completed study, uh, the ADAPT or Approaches and Decisions for Acute Pediatric Traumatic Brain Injury Trial, is the largest cohort of pediatric TBI patients studied to date. The trial enrolled 1,000 pediatric patients, ages 0 to 18, from 51 sites worldwide from 2014 to 2018. The intention of this study was to develop new level 2 recommendations for TBI guidelines focusing on tier 1 ICP therapies. This recently published ADAPT trial analysis aimed to compare the effectiveness of CSF diversion in decreasing ICP and improving outcomes in severe TBI patients. Of the 1,000 patients enrolled in the study, 376 received CSF diversion, such as an external ventricular drain. In propensity score matched analysis, there was no difference between groups in outcomes as measured by GOSCP score, but there was a decrease in overall ICP in the CSF diversion group. Hyperosmolar therapy is a mainstay of TBI treatment, though there are limited small studies of hypertonic saline and no studies exist for mannitol. Current guidelines include a level two recommendation for 3% hypertonic saline bolus between two to five milliliters per kilo for patients with intracranial hypertension. Another recent publication related to the ADAPT trial aimed to characterize the current use of hyperosmolar agents in pediatric severe TBI and assess whether hypertonic saline or mannitol is associated with a greater decrease in intracranial pressure and or increases in cerebral perfusion pressure. 77% of patients enrolled in ADAPT trial received hyperosmolar therapy and were included in this study. Bolus hypertonic saline was observed to decrease intracranial pressure and increase cerebral perfusion pressure, whereas mannitol was only observed to increase cerebral perfusion pressure. Hypertonic saline was associated with a greater reduction in ICP compared to with mannitol, but no association was seen after adjusting for confounders. And no differences in CPP increase were observed when comparing hypertonic saline and mannitol. Treatment effects were substratified according to the degree of intracranial hypertension. During ICP crisis, hypertonic saline performed better than mannitol at all three thresholds, ICP greater than 20, ICP greater than 25, and ICP greater than 30. These results remain significant after adjusting for confounders when ICP was greater than 25. 
Cerebrovascular pressure reactivity is the ability of vascular smooth muscles to react to changes in transmural pressure. The pressure reactivity index, or PRX, is a dynamic measurement of cerebrovascular pressure reactivity over time. First described in 1997, it is defined as the Pearson correlation coefficient between 30 consecutive 10-second averages of MAP and ICP, it, it basically five minutes of data, repeated every minute in an overlapping fashion to provide an updated value each minute. When the PRX is lowest, cerebral autoregulatory function is considered to be the best, and CPP at the lowest PRX is defined as CPP opt or CP optimal cerebral perfusion pressure. In adults, when PRX is plotted over a range of CPP, it can be characterized with a second order polynomial relationship or a U shaped curve. At both high and low values of CPP, PRX is elevated, suggesting inefficient cerebrovascular pressure reactivity. Here, a PRX of 0.3 is used to determine the upper and lower limits of regulation. The value where the PRX is the most negative is thought to be the optimal CPP. When regulation is inefficient, changes in ICP or changes in MAP positively correlate with changes in ICP. When cerebrovascular pressure reactivity is efficient, changes in MAP negatively correlate with changes in ICP. Some of the first studies of PRX in children have come from our group here at PCH. In 2021, this retrospective study evaluated 56 severe TBI patients was published. This paper aimed to evaluate four different indices of cerebral autoregulation, uh, including or optimal CPP and the dose of intracranial hypertension for each patient. The lower limit of autoregulation was based off of these four cerebral autoregulation indices, PRX, PAX, WPRX, and RAC. The primary outcome was GOSE PEED score at 12 months post injury. They found that increased percent of time below the lower limit of autoregulation was independently associated with poor outcomes when adjusted for age and initial GCS at presentation. A recent publication from South Africa examined 196 severe TBI patients prospectively from 2009 to 2019. They aimed to examine associations of PRX with ICP, CPP, and MAP, utilizing continuous invasive neuromonitoring data. Patients were treated to the following clinical goals. ICP less than or equal to 20 or 15 in children two or younger, CPP greater than or equal to 50 or 40 to 45 in children two or younger, and brain tissue oxygenation greater than or equal to 20. The primary outcome was survival, and the secondary outcome was morbidity usual, utilizing GOSEP scoring system at six months post injury. Spearman's rank correlation measures the strength of direct strength and direction of association between two ranked variables. When the variables are perfectly monotonically related, the Spearman rank correlation coefficient is one. If there is no relationship, it is zero. Utilizing Spearman rank correlation analysis, the overall median of each patient's entire monitoring period were compared. The following associations were demonstrated. ICP and PRX were moderately positively correlated. CPP and MAP were negatively correlated with PRX. Age and post-resuscitation GCS had no statistically significant correlation. Therefore, at a higher ICP and lower CPP and MAP, cerebrovascular pressure reactivity becomes more impaired as indicated by a higher PRX. This graphic shows median PRX plotted against groupings of CPP of 10 millimeters of mercury. As you can see, PRX was higher at lower CPPs and gradually decreased as CPP increased. 
PRX is at its lowest value, minus 0 0.04, when CPP is between 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury. Using an upper limit of 0.3 for PRX, this graph demonstrates a lower limit of regulation at, of CPP at about 40. However, the upper limit of regulation was not clearly illustrated. In the upper range of CPP, the increase in PRX was modest, suggesting a relatively preserved vascular reactivity at higher CPPs, which is consistent with an autoregulatory plateau. In summary, this study showed that PRX was consistently higher in patients with poor outcome. PRX had a moderate positive correlation with ICP and negative correlation with CPP. PRX and ICP were strong independent predictors of outcome. The PRX threshold of 0.25 had the best predictive ability for mortality. Quantitative EEG is a complementary technique to conventional EEG. It compresses hours of real-time EEG to provide a visual snapshot of brain activity. There are many quantitative EEG tools which each focus on different properties of the EEG. For example, amplitude integrated EEG provides the median amplitude of background activity. Color density spectral array displays power over time at various frequencies. Quantitative EEG software can also include proprietary algorithms which display rhythmicity spectrograms and automated seizure detection. EEG changes are closely tied to cerebral blood flow. When normal cerebral blood flow declines, the EEG first loses faster frequencies. Then as the cerebral blood flow decreases further, slower frequencies gradually increase. This represents a crucial ischemic threshold at which neurons begin to lose their transmembrane gradients, leading to infarction. As the cerebral blood flow continues to decrease toward the infarction threshold, the EEG becomes silent and cellular damage becomes irreversible. The alpha-delta ratio, or ADR, is a quantitative EEG metric derived from a power ratio of faster alpha frequencies over slower delta frequencies. The ratio is averaged over time and displayed as a line graph with the y-axis as the numerical value for the ratio, and the left hemisphere is classically displayed as a blue line with the right hemisphere in red. This trend is often applied to detect focal cerebral ischemia based on the principles that as cerebral blood flow decreases, the first electrographic change is a decrease in alpha frequencies, followed by an increase in slower theta and then delta frequencies. Pilot study data of pediatric TBI patients has shown ADR is linked with changes in brain tissue oxygenation and can predict intracranial hypertension and correlate with cerebral perfusion pressure. This study from our group uh, published last year is a retrospective analysis of 63 severe TBI patients where the first 24 hours of QEG metrics, such as the suppression percentage and the alpha delta ratio were used to present, predict ICP, PRX and PBTO2 values for the first seven days post-injury and GOSCP values at 12 months post-injury. The model identified that increased suppression percentage and PRISM scores predicted increased ICP with suppression percentages less than five and greater than or equal to 45% being predictive of the dose of intracranial hypertension. When accounting for age and GCS score, increased suppression percentages predicted increased PRX values suggestive of inefficient cerebrovascular pressure reactivity with suppression percentages greater than five and greater than 45% being predictive of a median PRX values greater than or equal to 0 0.3. Lower GCS scores, the, the presence of seizures and increased suppression percentages, each were independently associated with higher GOSEP scores, suggestive of unfavorable outcomes. 
The study concludes that increased electro increased EEG suppression percentages on the initial day of monitoring may identify patients with pediatric TBI at risk of increased ICP, inefficient cerebrovascular pressure reactivity, and unfavorable outcomes. This recent PCH study is a retrospective analysis of 19 severe TBI patients, which aim to assess the correlation of quantitative EEG and ADR with invasive PDTO2 monitoring. Continuous invasive partial pressure of brain tissue oxygenation measurements can be obtained from intraparenchymal probes. There's a level three recommendation to maintain PBTO2 at greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. Some adult studies suggest promoting PBTO2 values above 15 or 20 millimeters of mercury may help prevent brain tissue hypoxia. In this cohort, reductions in PBTO2 values to less than 10 millimeters of mercury were associated with a reduction in alpha-delta ratio. This suggests that ADR and QEG can provide a non-invasive estimate of brain tissue hypoxia. Here is a case illustration from the study. This patient's vasoactive support was increased to help raise the mean arterial pressure, after which a rise in PBTO2 and an increase in alpha-delta ratio was seen, showing improved brain tissue oxygenation. This is a cute EEG study that I've been working on with Dr. Apavu and recently presented at ACNS. It is a retrospective analysis of 33 severe TBI patients in the Phoenix Children's PICU from 2014 to 2021. We aim to investigate alpha-delta ratio during ICP plateau waves. The alpha-delta ratio was collected during plateau waves of intracranial hypertension, where intracranial pressure exceeded 20 millimeters of mercury. Patients were then substratified using PRX into two groups, inefficient cerebral autoregulation, or PRX greater than 0.3, or efficient cerebral autoregulation, or PRX less than 0.3. We fit linear mixed effects models with a random intercept for each subject and the grouping variable cerebral autoregulation. The covariate and two-way interaction as fixed effects and an autoregressive order of one to model, su to model subject variation and correlate for within subject observations. Of the 33 patients identified, the median PRX for the reporting suggested efficient cerebral autoregulation in 27 patients and inefficient cerebral autoregulation in six patients. When cerebral autoregulation was efficient, during periods of increased intracranial pressure, the alpha-delta ratio increased, suggestive of an intravascular source to the intracranial hypertension. No relationship between ICP and ADR was identified when cerebral autoregulation was inefficient, suggesting ICP spikes could be due to other reasons such as obstructive hydrocephalus or cerebral edema. When cerebral autoregulation was efficient, ADR and MAP were positively related. When cerebral autoregulation was inefficient, ADR and MAP were inversely related. This first case shows an ICP plateau wave in a patient with efficient cerebral autoregulation. As the green ICP line increases, there is a concordant rise in the black alpha-delta ratio line, consistent with increased cerebral blood flow. This patient may be less likely to benefit from CSF diversion with an EVD or hyperosmolar therapy such as hypertonic saline. Their ICP may respond better to increased sedation or paralysis, hyperventilation, or optimizing CPP by raising the blood pressure. This second case shows an ICP plateau wave in a patient with inefficient cerebral autoregulation. The rise in ICP occurs in the setting of high MAP and low alpha-delta ratio. This suggests that blood flow is being compromised by high ICP. This patient's ICP may respond better to hyperosmolar therapy to decrease cerebral edema rather than working to increase cerebral perfusion pressure or MAP, which may worsen intracranial hypertension.
These multimodal monitoring principles don't just apply to traumatic brain injured patients. These techniques can be applied to a variety of patients with acute brain injuries, such as cardiac arrest, stroke, ECMO, brain tumors, encephalopathies, and meningitis. What I would like you to take away from this presentation is that there are many ways to use your bedside monitors to assess intracranial dynamics in patients both invasively and non-invasively, such as QEG, pupillometry, NIRS, PBTO2, ICP, CPP, and TCD. Used together as a composite, these monitors can guide clinical management. There's still much to be learned about optimal target treatment targets in brain injured children, but preliminary results suggest physiologic targets differ from adults. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. And um, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Katie, for a great talk. Uh, anybody has any questions, feel free to talk or put it in the chat. I'll perhaps start with one. Um, what you know, you know, you, having completed your fellowship trade, your your one year with us this year, and, and learning the things that you have, um, what are some of the things you you think you'll start to incorporate, or um, um, in terms of your career and in, in, as a sort of a critical care uh, attending moving forward um, in neurocritical care? I think especially knowing the literature and, and having this experience, um, I was probably more focused on ICP directed management um, in just lowering the ICP and, um, you know, pantobarb coma, things like that. Um, whereas this has kind of taught me more to focus on not only that, but also cerebral perfusion pressure and to see if the patient is in a hyperemic or ischemic state and and what um, and how the CPP modulation can affect the um, intracranial pressure. Okay. Uh, have some examples of the application of these parameters. Um, examples. Well, I don't. I don't think it's in the chat. Are you, is there a chat question? I don't see. I got a. I got a question to me that okay. to have some exam examples of the application of these parameters. So, I guess. Um, as an example for a, a patient, we recently had um, the cerebral perfusion pressure thresholds that we had set were on the lower end of like 55. And we were able to see with the NIRS and um, with the transcranial Doppler that the um, blood flow improved um, while and the ICP was um, stable with higher cerebral perfusion, with higher MAP. So we uh, initiated some um, blood pressure medicines to, to raise the blood pressure um, and ultimately improved the intracranial pressure. Any other questions? Sorry, I went kind of quick. I mean, I think if if there are no other questions, I, I think we can end early. Um, thank you all for joining. Thank you.